Hello, and welcome to another episode of the B2B Leadership Podcast. My name is Nils Vinya, and today my guest is Mark Stuse. Mark, welcome to the show. Hey, it's great to be with you. Oh, wonderful to be with you as well. Super excited to dig into all things leadership with you. But first, would you share a little bit about the role that you're in today and the company that you're working with? Sure. I'm, I am the uh, founder and CEO of a analytics software company called Proof Analytics. Um, we took marketing mixed modeling, uh, or you know, if you want to think of it more technically, regression, multivariable regression uh, analytics, and automated it. Um, and then it essentially combined that with what's called a marketing resource management uh, platform, which is does every it's the system of record for marketing teams, uh, everything from planning and budgeting and approvals and asset management and the whole deal. And so we are kind of the first to, though, to bring it full circle, closed loop with the analytics involved. So wow. when you come back around for your next planning cycle, you have the analytics to tell you how to place your bets. Whew. OK, that you guys cover a lot of ground and being the first to bring everything full circle. I know the marketing world um, can often be characterized as a million different tools doing one tiny piece of the puzzle. But it sounds you like you brought That's it all fair. together. That's a very fair statement. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> certainly what I've seen. Um, what are, yep. Who are the types of marketing organizations that you work with? Uh, pretty much, uh, I would say the upper end of the mid range all the way through the enterprise uh, is is our sweet spot. Um, so we cut across all kinds of different industries. We have customers in you know tech and pharma and uh, manufacturing and all, you know just all kinds of stuff, right? The the math on this is uh, and the fundamental features and functions of MRM, for example, and MMM um, are agnostic, right? Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's not something that's has to be for one or two industries and not for anyone else. Well, and that's an interesting um, piece and is always a, you know, good topic for discussion is, you know, there's, there's expertise that can be derived by focusing just on certain verticals. And then there's, you know, broad applicability, a horizontal play, if you will, when you're going across that. So um, how does that. Well, and everybody has there. So there are kind of like, the top 20 or top 50 questions that everybody wants to know. Sure. Uh, and then depending on your industry or your company or whatever, right. There's always little, you know, different flavors of those questions. Mm -hmm. um, but the customization is not in the math. The customization is in what do you want to know? And mm -hmm. then the data sets that are involved in arming uh, a model. Wow. That's interesting. And your proof analytics set up to be able to answer those questions across whatever you know discipline or vertical or domain that you happen to be working with your client. Yeah, I mean, we're, we you know sometimes we get involved in actually doing it for mm -hmm. the customer, but we are primarily a software company, and so we license the use just like any other SaaS tool, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, the the customer or a partner that the customer works with or, you know, outsourcing partner or whatever, um, will actually uses our tool to answer their questions. Hmm. Cool. That's awesome. Fascinating stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thanks for the overview and kind of where you focus, what you do. Now let's shift gears and talk leadership and your CEO today and founder of your company. But I know it wasn't always the case. So would you take us back in time and share how did you get into your first leadership position? <laughs> yeah, well, it was a very long and winding road and, and probably will always be that way. <clears throat> I think that that is sort of my life, uh, uh, you know, in a nutshell. Um you know, I started in politics, uh, and I even before that, I was actually a reporter. Um, I wrote for Newsweek and stuff like that. And that took me into politics, um, and then I ended up in PR uh, with large uh, agencies like Edelman and Hill and Knowlton, primarily doing public affairs type work for large uh, corporates. Um, and then I, went, I had the opportunity to go into a small 
uh, company and and be a part of making it a much bigger uh, company. And I did that for a little while, about seven years. And then I went back on the consulting side um, in the tech world, in the in the Valley. And, and, and then I hopped back onto the corporate side with, uh, with Compaq and HP and then BMC and then Honeywell and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And so I have, I have kind of tasted leadership at different levels and in completely different kinds of situations. Uh, and so that is, that has really, you know, had a much greater impact on me than I probably guessed at the time. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, from politics to PR, <laughs> small companies, big companies, consulting, in seat, there's a, a wide range across a lot of different disciplines, not too different what you described in the clients that you work with today, which is- Well, fortunately fortunately for me, Right. I had really great examples, mm -hmm. um, both, you know, I mean, everyone always talks about the great examples, right? The, the people that you want to be like and all that kind of stuff. And you pattern yourself after. And those are super important, but uh, of equal value and in some cases, greater value. Um, although, you, you know, you kind of hope you don't have any more than are absolutely necessary to teach you a lesson. <laughs> But it's the bad ones, right? Mm. The, the bad examples are are crucial, you know. And you you watch them, and you see what they do to other people. Uh, and and uh, in my case, at least, I just I remember sitting there a lot of times saying, "Man, I'm never going to do it that way." So let's let's dig in on that a little bit because I agree with you 100 percent that the the bad ones are just as important, if not more so, and. Frankly, we tend to remember the more visceral negative experiences than the positive ones sometimes. So um, can you share with us an example, perhaps from the politics <laughs> time in the earliest part of one of the earliest parts of your career where I'm sure there was ample opportunity to <laughs> do lots of different things as the, you know, what the perception is in oh, the outside yeah. of the political world. But was it really like working inside that type of environment? So, you know, at the end of the day, whether it's that or anything else, right, we all live with an angel and a devil on each shoulder. Mm -hmm. and, and which one we listen to is super important. Yeah. I would say that even though I was surrounded by some really great leadership examples, including a, a past president of the United States, um, I when I was in politics, I was personally... I was very young. I was personally very ambitious. I was in kind of almost like innately good at it. Um, and I had a tendency to be a, a, a little bit of a chameleon. I could, I could pretty mm -hmm. much be what anybody really needed me to be in any given situation. Um, I think looking back on it, I was clearly manipulative um, uh, and, and so I, but all of a sudden I had this experience that would actually take me too long to describe, but I had this experience, this epiphany when I realized that the, the, the person I was becoming was not the person I ultimately really wanted to be at all. Mm. And that for me at that moment, there wasn't any way to, <clears throat> to be different and stay in politics. Mm. And I'm not saying that that's true for everybody, but it's sort of like, you know, if you're trying to stop drinking, maybe going to a lot of parties is not super helpful. Right. Yeah. Right. And so I just bailed. Right. I totally, I just uh, cut all the, all the cords um, very quickly in, in, in many respects. And, uh, and did you yeah. leave DC then? I mean, I literally did. physically yeah, yeah. cutting the cord. And I, and I, and I, I, what I did do is I kind of stayed in the loop for a little bit doing some really cool stuff for president Bush, the first mm -hmm. president Bush at that time. But, uh, but I was outside of, you know, the, the, the circles, the, the circles. Yeah. And, um, 
that's the other thing that's kind of, I guess, you know, as a leader, you, or, or not even a leader, you, 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 you're in situations where you're inside and the next day you're totally outside and, mm -hmm. um, people who would have returned your call in three seconds flat don't return your call at all anymore because hmm. you can't do anything for them. Right. Um, and so that is, that's also, that's something I've really, I, 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 I'm like anyone else. I'm not always successful at it, but my intention, and I think most of the time, right. I really try and stay in touch with, with people, even if they can't, even if it doesn't benefit me professionally to do so. Um, hmm. I, I just, uh, I think it's just part of being a good human being. Yeah. I absolutely agree. And um, it's interesting to hear about it in an environment in which the only basis for relationship was really mutual benefit or perhaps one side benefiting like in the political world. And what I'm hearing you say now is that there has to be more than that in order to foster a real relationship in order to get people. To yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, I think that at one level, right this highly transactional type of relationship that exists in politics um, or, or did exist in politics at the time was sort of a manifestation of what democracy is all about, what politics mm -hmm. is really all about, right? It's about compromise and it's about everybody getting some piece of what it is that they wanted, right? Yep. And, um, yep. Understanding that you rarely uh, get it all. And you probably should never get it all mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in politics. Um, whereas today it's totally binary, right? And, and people would rather not cut any deals at all uh, than try and compromise. Right. So, uh, but I think that what is systemically a good thing, most of the time, a lot of the time, can be really problematic for some individuals. And I was one of those individuals Yeah. Um, at that time. And, um, you know, if everything is a deal and there's really kind of fundamentally no principles involved and you're more of a gunslinger, mm -hmm. more of a mercenary of sorts, <clears throat> that's not, that's, you know, you might actually end up being uh, a really helpful cog in the machine with that attitude, yeah. but it, it, it's not going to make you a very good person. Right. And that's what you came to this epiphany of where the person who you were was not the person that you wanted to become. So yeah. in the moment when you realize this and you realize that your environment was not conducive to the person that you wanted to become, um, yeah. I imagine that was a pretty Actually, tough. I was not, that I was not a good leader and that power was at that moment was not a good thing for me to have. That's good. Okay. That's so the, that self-awareness, right. The right. self-awareness was huge, right? right? That was what your entire decision to leave that world was based off of your awareness. of It might have been the only true self-awareness that I had at the time, by the way. Which is fascinating yeah. in that it led you just down to such a different path. And if you had ignored it and just said, you know what, I'm really good at this. I could see a long career and be very successful and rise up through the ranks and whatever. Right. right? Yeah. So in that moment, when you realize this and that awareness came full frontal view, it must've been really challenging and, and a little bit unnerving because this was you know fairly early in your career. Did you have another option lined up? Did you just cut bait and just say, I'm out, I got to move, I got to leave, I'm done? Like, take us through the decision process, because sometimes from a leadership position, especially when it comes to leading yourself, it's really hard to make that call if you don't know what's on the other side. Yeah, I think that for, for me personally, right, um, functionally, right, finding the next step, in other words, well, I mean, finding the next paycheck, okay, Yep. was was uh, was not particularly difficult okay. um, but I mean the entire uh, like you don't make particularly at that at that age that level of of stuff right you're never you're not making a lot of money 
the, in politics, right? I mean, you're you're sleeping in a in a old brownstone with like eight other guys, and they're all, everyone's doing more or less the same thing. Yeah. So actually, I I think I pretty much got a raise net net when I left <laughs> politics, right? But I but I got a I went from so a big part of the currency for me was prestige and power and access yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Right. And that went from, particularly in the context of being a young guy that went from like 98% to zero or at least wow. below 5%. Right. And, uh, and that was really tough. That was really, really hard, but it, it strangely enough, and this is this is going to sound like I had way more self awareness than I did, and that I'm, you know, some sort of borderline early proto saint, but I wasn't right. But um, but I I somehow knew that 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 was good for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That it was not enjoyable at all. I felt like you know it was almost like going through the DTs, right? Uh, you know, coming off of so I've never I've never done. Uh, addictive substances, but everything I've ever known about them, right? That's what it, it's like, right? And I, I definitely felt like I was detoxing, yeah. Um, you know, from a powerful drug. Wow, <clears throat> and and that I think is a really good point that the environment that we're in <laughs> is either going to be conducive to who we are as a leader or who we want to become, or it's. Maybe not. And I know there's a lot of organizations out there where people struggle with the culture is not one that aligns with who they are personally or professionally. And sometimes they can feel like yeah, they're in the exact so same I, I mean, One of the things that I really have learned since then is who I surround myself with mm -hmm. has a huge impact on what I will become. And that's not a, that's not a new thought. It's, you know, it's, that didn't just, you know, spring out of my head, like, you know, Athena from Zeus's forehead, right? Um, that that uh, a lot of people talk about this, but I have found that it is really true, right? Yeah. It's yeah. really true. It's not a it's little a, bit true. It's a lot true. It's a lot true. So tell us a little bit about who you surround yourself inside the, how you built proof analytics. What was the, what was the construct for you're the beginning and you grew this team and you want to surround yourself with people, what kind of people were they that you wanted to bring along with you? Um, high integrity people, mm -hmm. uh, people who really wanted to help other people mm -hmm. in, in, in some very challenging areas of business. And, you know, one of the things that has been really hard for me as uh, the founder and CEO of Proof is that in a corporate environment, um, I think I, I got to be almost famous in certain circles anyway, for my ability to put together a really awesome team, mm -hmm. with no bad eggs. Right. Wow. Um, for whatever reason, that has been harder to achieve uh, in, in startup land. Um, it's, it's actually been very humbling, you know, uh, to, to realize that someone, if, I mean, like a hard lesson is if a person wants to deceive you, particularly about themselves, they will succeed. Right. Absolutely. I mean, you just absolutely positively that will happen. And then you will be dealing with, you know, every, the, what comes from that, including the unwinding of it. Right. Yes. And uh, and the, and the collateral damage, not only to the business, but to other people that you feel really terrible um, about. Right. I mean, I've apologized uh, for this kind of thing to my team um, on three different occasions that I can remember, mm -hmm. you know, and and my uh, my apology was I'm so sorry that because I got it wrong, you had a hard time. Right. Uh, and and uh, and and it's a terrible it, it's a terrible thing. Right. It really is. I, I have worked with leaders 
even leaders that I otherwise really think very highly of that um, if they had a really ultra high performance person who was also a terrible human being, they wouldn't pull the cord fast enough. Mm -hmm. They were scared of of upending the apple cart, right? Yeah. And they were hoping that somehow it would just magically take care of itself in some way. Um, And I will tell you this, I swore at the time that I would never make that mistake. Mm -hmm. I have made that mistake. Um, I don't think I have made it. I don't think I've waited as long, um, but I definitely have. So I have an, I have an empathy for those leaders that I didn't have before. Hmm. It doesn't mean that they're right or that I was right. Uh, but I certainly get their concerns and what they're trying to juggle. Yeah. You know, cause no one is saying, Oh, you know what? I, I, you know, I think he's a total jerk, but I'm, I just don't care. They, they pretty much all care. They just, um, the hierarchy of what you feel like you have to care about is difficult to navigate. Yeah. A lot of times. Absolutely. I love what you said there about being vulnerable enough to apologize to your team that if you made a decision that negatively impacted them to recognize that they were impacted. Right. It sounds so conceptually simple, but from a CEO, especially, I mean, in, in a, in a SaaS world, right. One of the, classic lines and just scenarios everybody gets involved in is that, Hey, we have to sell deals in order to hit numbers in order to deliver, um, expectations, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes customers are a good fit. Sometimes eh, there's a little bit of gray area and sometimes they're just flat out wrong, but a deal had to be done and it was done. So I'm curious from the CEO seat, Right? You now run your own SaaS business. You are now responsible for what happens on the sales side and everything that gets sold and what happens on the customer success side and how everything gets retained and delivered. So I'm curious how you draw the line between that, because I'm sure in the companies that you worked for and the experience you've had, it's been across the board in terms of what people were willing to do in order to achieve their end goal. But now the buck stops with you. And if you don't sell in the right way to for the long-term customer, you guys are going to be hurt and you might have to apologize to your team more. So how do you um, rationalize those pieces and how do you keep that in mind as a CEO? So I, th- I think this is where <clears throat> the culture that you build with other people in your company, not just you, although as CEO, you have to exemplify it, right? Um, is so, it's so important. So <clears throat> one of the first principles that we all agreed on years ago was that we would never oversell the capabilities of our platform at any given moment, right? Um, we were going to, what, whatever it was that we represented was going to be absolutely provably true mm-hmm. and that we weren't going to sell aspirationally from, from a product roadmap point of view. Uh, I mean, we we're certainly transparent with our roadmap, but we're also <laughs> equally transparent about, Hey, here's the bright yellow line yeah. and everything on this side of the line totally exists 110%. And everything on that side of the line hadn't been delivered yet. Hmm. Right. So hang on. So in that, in the early days coming together with this team, and one of the first principles you talked about was never overselling the capabilities of your platform, which kind of flies in the face of most every stuff, software startup that has ever existed, being that that's usually the primary thing is you sell the vision and then hope to keep people along long enough in order to fulfill it or deliver against it. So was there any <laughs> dissension on this? Was there a question about, well, can we actually build a business and still do this at the same time? Like, what was the discussion like? Actually, the the real answer is no, there was no dissension at all uh, about it because the reality is is that even though most SaaS companies don't 
set out to lie mm-hmm. about the product, they are so they're selling aspirationally just you know, and it's an incremental thing. It's it's kind of like all lies, pretty much, right? Yeah. They start yeah. out really small, and then you got to kind of like create a second supporting tier of yep. falsehood to support the first one, right? Yep. And before you know it, you, you're you, you, what you're actually saying is just crap, right? Yeah. It's not true, right? And so we also, you know, more pragmatically, uh, we also really were looking at a lot of data that we had gotten from Gartner and Forrester and other places um, that was really showing that uh, a vast percentage two thirds or more of the churn that occurs in SaaS businesses is tied to one thing, unmet expectations, the yep. gap between <laughs> what they were sold and what they ultimately got. Right. Yep. yep. And, um, and churn is incredibly expensive. Yes. In is. so many ways. Right. Not yep. only do you, you know, so it costs you a fair amount of money to acquire the customer, then they churn. So you, you know, you you now have truncated the lifetime value of that account dramatically. You basically have lost money on that whole transaction hugely. Yeah. Um, you also have created a situation of like a negative reference mm-hmm. in a world that is increasingly peer-to-peer references. Yeah. So you probably will never know when that negative reference gets passed along, but it will get passed along and you will lose additional business as a result of it and it will hurt your brand. So um, so we just decided that that was not a good idea the, the other thing we really decided is that the ICP, the ideal customer profile, was super, super important for us mm-hmm. to get right. And one of the reasons why it's so important is that you want to be able to ask three questions, Max, in the first meeting that essentially um, you want to help the prospect to disqualify themselves yeah. as a customer. Mm-hmm. And you want that to happen really fast. Yeah. Because the op- the law of opportunity costs is alive and well, right? And so if you if you spend a lot of time and it doesn't go anywhere, then not only have you lost that one, it's what you could have spent the time on with somebody else, right? So also, I mean, I realize that there are people who disagree with this and, and that's okay. But evangelism at best is a very hard, very time lagged, meaning long time horizon business approach. Yeah. Right. And and if you are if your ICP isn't framed correctly and you're you're talking to people who are not high enough on the maturity curve for whatever it is that you're selling, then you're going to have a real problem. Right. And so we uh, and even if you win, right, your problems have just started. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Because like we had a we had a a apps in the very beginning. One of our very first customers was a super premium tech brand. I mean, this is like. Doesn't get a whole lot more significant. Yeah. But they didn't have their own act together at Mm -hmm. all. Um, And so making progress was really tough. And in the end, we actually, you know, in the, in the absolute nicest possible way, um, we ended the agreement because it was too much, it was too burdensome for a small company. And so one of your earliest customers that was one of the biggest lighthouse names didn't end up being a great fit on account of lots of things that were going on their side. And you actually ended the agreement because it was not going to be worth your time and the return to ultimately stick with them 
because of the situation. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly it. Wow. That's powerful. It doesn't happen very often. <laughs> no, and you, and you, trust me, you don't want it to happen a lot, right? Uh, because then, then you're obviously, you know, you're attriting your own business, right? Sure. But um, well, it doesn't but, happen very often where you the company takes a stand like that, recognizes honestly what it is costing, even with the brand recognition and name and marketing potential, right? Doesn't make this doesn't take the stand. That's what doesn't happen very often. It, it, it exists all over the place. There's a lots of train wrecks, especially in early days with customers, but taking the stand takes a lot of courage and it has to have a culture behind it. Just like what you've described, where you got to be really clear on who you help, how you can help them so that they can get the value and they probably weren't being served either. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, it's, and like one of the hardest things for us to, to learn as we move through this whole thing is that almost everybody will say, Oh yeah, absolutely. Right. You know, I am passionate about understanding the ROI on my marketing spend. Sure. But they're really not. Hmm. Actions speak louder than words. Actions speak louder than words, right? Yeah. And so we have become, right, you know, if we're expert on on anything today, uh, we are expert on determining how true that statement is, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the questions we ask people right out of the gate is, because it, it's all about how do they make decisions, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll say, hey, you know, um, what do you think about the science and the math behind climate change study? All right. So you're using a completely different. Yeah. And it's, and it's not about the, uh, your politics. This is not about politics. Yeah, yeah. Right. right. Um, but if they, if they basically say, Oh, I think it's just a bunch of bull. Mm -hmm. When clearly it's not, it doesn't mean that everything is understood. Okay. But it's yeah. clearly not bull. Right. Yeah. Then this is a person that no matter what the analytics, no matter what the data has to say, if it disagrees with what they believe, they will not mm -hmm. listen to it. Wow. That's not a customer. That's, and so you've just disqualified that potential customer yep. as a result of asking them a question about climate change. Yeah, or sometimes sometimes we put it to them in the context of epidemiology. Um, yeah. You know, there's there's a there's a zillion of them. If you don't want to, if if you don't want to be kind of like so in their face uh, with yeah, something yeah, like yeah. climate change, you can pick something else, and it's just as you know viable, right, uh, as a question. But, but you're, what you're looking for is how they respond to a, in your case, data and analytics without talking right. about marketing data and analytics. Totally. I mean, you know, and, and what you also realize is how intensely personal this subject it really is, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So like a lot of times when we sell into a customer, finance is, is part of the equation. Yep. Um, and the finance guys, because of what they do, right, they immediately get what we do, what our product does. Yeah. And, and, they, and they, they, they're totally switched on with it. And then you can see it, feel it, sometimes even hear it, right, where they're, they're clearly uh, sharpening their knives uh, mm -hmm. as far mm -hmm. as marketing is concerned. You know, we're yep. finally going to get those sons of guns, right? We're going to get uh, them in line with what we want. <laughs> right. And, and, then, yeah. and, and then the marketers are often very concerned. Oh, right? 100%. Uh, I mean, they may not be in the fetal position, but they are very <laughs> concerned. And then invariably what happens, because the 80-20 rule is alive and well, okay, is that the analytics will start to, to roll in. And 80, 85% of what a marketing team is doing is really good. It's having a great impact. It's turning in great ROI, um, right? It's just really a winner. And, the, and then you yeah. got kind of like this 15 to 20% piece that is, it could be kind of like all over the map. Um, yep. And um, 
But now you know what it is and you can correct it. You can Mm -hmm. rapidly eliminate that kind of stuff. And the finance guys are sort of nonplussed a lot of times because they were sort of really, if the truth be is, you know, if everyone really deals in truth here, yep. they really were looking forward to putting marketing on a spit and turning it very slowly. Right. Yep. yep. Um, and they're not, that's not what the analytics are telling them they get to do. Hmm. And all of a sudden the marketers are, you know, proverbially, you know, kicking back in their chair, smoking a cigar. And their response a lot of times is, see, we, we, we knew it. We just couldn't prove it. Yeah, we knew what it's, we were doing. Which is true, right? Yeah, yeah. But the, but the fact of the matter is, though, is that you were always a little bit afraid to pr- really prove it, mm-hmm. right? Um, yeah. And, uh, and now, you you know, so finance actually sort of did you a favor, even though maybe they didn't look at it that way themselves, right? So, yeah, I mean, there's the just, a, you know, I, so one of the things that I've really learned as a leader and as a, hopefully as a human being, irrespective of whether I'm leading anyone, whether there's anyone behind me doing anything, right? Yeah. Um, is the truth, the truth, deal in the truth, mm-hmm. right? You, you will never be sad that you, that you did that, right? Yeah. And, and yeah. so like our reputation today, even though perhaps we would have had more customers had we hyped it more, Right. Sure. Is that we've had very low levels of churn. I bet. Right. And and that is, uh, you know, in some in some cases, our renewals are. You know, we've had, you know, one customer, five renewals, you know, I mean, Mm -hmm. and and most of the renewals are expansions as well. Right. And so, yeah, you know, so you're just kind of like, hey, you know what? This is this is good. This is good. And. And, and they, they have a lot of confidence and they have a lot of trust. And that's what you want, particularly when they start talking to their peers yep. about your product. You want that conversation to just exude confidence and trust. That's right. Because that's what's yeah. in such, such short supply today, right? I yes. mean, I don't care whether, whether you're talking about SaaS companies or politicians or whatever, right? It, it's It's confidence yeah. and trust. I mean... People have told so many untruths, right? Yep. That yep. it's shattered the bonds. hundred percent. And to, you know, make good on that requires just dealing in truth, as you said. I love how simple that conceptually simple, yet sometimes difficult that can be, especially for businesses that have all kinds of you know, targets on them, whether those are internal targets or external targets from a investment perspective or investor perspective or the market perspective, whatever it is, but comes down to making the leadership decision to deal in truth. And I think that's incredible. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the, the other big thing I would say here, and which is totally backed up by the analytics too, by the way, is that most of the factors that drive any particular outcome Mm-hmm. Uh, are outside of our control. How do you mean? So, I mean, the headwinds and tailwinds of any situation mm-hmm. uh, make up probably 60, 65% of the total. Okay. So you're really, it's it's not a question of being cap, you know, master of the universe and captain of your destiny and all this kind of stuff, uh, as good as that sounds. The reality is, is that you're either in any moment surfing the wave well or poorly mm-hmm. 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 but you are not creating the wave yeah. like the the, yes. the second you believe that you're the wave master mm-hmm. is the, i mean the very next second is when you're gonna get dumped on take a head, nosedive yeah right <laughs> and so <laughs> i think that what that also means though is that it, far from being an excuse it means that controlling and maximizing and optimizing what you do control. Yeah. Right. Becomes even more important. Agree. Particularly in a, uh, an environment with a lot of uh, high velocity, high volatility change. Yeah. Agree. And that's something I champion with every single leadership coaching client I've ever worked with is less focus on what you do control 
because there's a million other things outside that are going to well, influence what's going on. But we got to bring it back to exactly what you do control. Fascinating. Um, all right, Mark, last question here. So let's say you could go back in time uh, and sit down with your younger self when you were still in DC in those early days, but you know everything that you know now, all the experiences you've had, the leadership lessons that you've shared with us, all the good, the bad, and the ugly, and you could sit down with your younger self, what advice would you share? Uh, I think I would have to say that, and again, I didn't come up with this, but I think it sums it up really, really well. Ego is the enemy. Mm -hmm. Anytime I find myself, even today, wanting to emphasize certain things, a lot of times if I'm if I stop and I think about it, I realize that I'm trying to protect my ego. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that is, and the problem is, of course, is that it's a really super slippery slope, right? Because that first statement that you make that protects your ego yeah, probably will be 90% true, 95% mm -hmm. true, right? Yeah. But then all of a sudden you're just like sliding fast. I mean, it's just, that's the, that's really the way it is. Right. And so for example, like with investors, there are certain conversations I just will not have. Right. Uh, so I give guidance. Um, I certainly give, you know, updates against that guidance, all that stuff. Um, yeah. you know, all the normal stuff. But as soon as an investor or a would be investor wants to, have a conversation about possible outcomes, mm. which is what they, what they really mean is like an exit. Yeah. Right. Their return. Mm -hmm. I, I, I won't even go there. Hmm. Right. Because number one, great companies are not sold or purchased. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of like a romantic relationship, right? Uh, yeah. You can't quote unquote, make it happen. Right. <laughs> um, so, I mean, um, and if you do, it might, <laughs> it might be illegal, right? Yeah. Um, oh yeah. And, and so, and so you're, and so I just, uh, you know, I will just say, look, you know what? I, your imagination is probably better than mine. Um, but you know, you're asking me now to be a prophet mm -hmm. and I'm not one. What's their response when you say that? Um, I think that sometimes it's frustrating. I bet. Um, I think a lot of times after they stop and think about it, they really respect it. Mm -hmm. um, they probably don't you know, One of the other things I say to a new investor, because they always say, you know, like, you know, and they back into it, right? So they want to talk about the future. And then they, based on that, they kind of like, well, they ask me, right? So how, how much should I invest? And I'll say, well, you know, that's an absolutely, not only an impossible answer for me to give you, it's a completely inappropriate answer for me to give you. Mm -hmm. Because I have no idea what your risk tolerance is. I have no idea about your rest of your portfolio, your total net worth, anything like that, right? Other than what you've shared with me, you know, it, you know to get us a, uh, an accredited investor status or, you know, whatever. Um, and so, you know, that's just, um, I'm just not, so actually the shorthand answer is, you know, to try and be friendly about it, mm -hmm. is I will just say, Hey, you know, you invest whatever you can afford to lose in a worst case scenario where you and I can still have dinner the next week. <laughs> wow. That's powerful. Right. Yeah. Which tends to skew people yeah. lower, mm -hmm. but actually, you know, it, it tends to go the other way. Right. Yeah. Um, Counterintuitive. So then, you know, d d just to show you that there's, that there is, you know, there, there's, uh, there, there's, um, you just always have to be careful here. Um, when I started seeing that pattern, 
I had some really significant dialogues with myself mm-hmm. and with my the board board members that I really trust, you know, more than, you know, I trust all my board members, but some of them have seen more. Um, and, and I'm like, man, I'm, I'm seeing such a strong pattern here. It's hard not to see my answer in terms of reverse psychology. Yeah. Right. Which to mm-hmm. me in my life feels like manipulation. Yep. Even though that's not what I'm trying to do, I actually don't trust myself mm-hmm. enough that somewhere squirreled away in that little reptile brain, right? Uh, that that somewhere it's not true, right? And um, and so now I just I don't even say that, yeah. Right? I just uh, I just say, hey, you know what? That's your decision. You got to make that decision. Only you can yeah. make that decision. That's powerful. And again, you know, you've demonstrated multiple times today on our on our chat here how taking a you know a, an approach that is authentic to you has served you well, even though it's completely contrary to most of what happens in the B2B SaaS world. And you know, for that one, I'm grateful to have connected with you and know about this because I know that what you described as being inside of proof is the ideal that every customer success professional in particular, have a lot of ex- background and expertise in that area, would die on the hill to go and work for a company that recognized that where the CEO says that we are going to sell to our ideal customer and we're going to hold true to what we actually say we're going to do because that's usually the bane of our existence. right? And hey, every hey, other- can, I, can I just uh, sure. add one more thing real fast? Sure. As a leader, one of the things that I have learned to do, I probably started doing this like 15 years ago, mm-hmm. so much more in a corporate environment, but it's it's doesn't matter, is um, I, I, am, I start out the conversation in an interview process by telling them what I think it's really like to work for me. Okay. Sort of like the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm-hmm. And and if they want to have, if they want to share that about themselves, that's really awesome because you know it requires a lot of self awareness uh, to do that. Yep. Uh, but I don't make them go first; I go first. And like yeah. on references, um, I may ask for the references at the end of the process, but I give them my references. Mm you know, at the beginning Hmm. and I, and I just say, Hey, you know what? You're welcome. You know, I think my current reference list is like 50 people. Right. And I say, you can call any of them. You can call none of them. You can call all of them. You can do whatever you want to do. Right. Yeah. Yep. And they're all instructed to tell you as best as they can from their own experience, what I'm like, because I don't want somebody to get into a situation and say, you know, holy moly, if I had only known, I wouldn't have done this. A hundred percent. You know, I do the same thing with the com- with the companies that I have represented and that I represent today, right? I'll just yeah. say, look, man, this is the truth. Like, yeah. And mm-hmm. Honeywell, Honeywell, heavily matrixed organization. You are not going to be able to get to a rapid decision on yeah. anything, mm-hmm. right? So. Mm-hmm. If that is a really super negative thing for you, this is not it. Yeah. Right? Love it. Because if it bugs you in the first month, a year later, you're just going to be just insane. Pulling your hair out. Right? Ready to leave. Yeah. And so I just, I, that's, I really started doing that because I don't want, like a, a catastrophe for me personally would be, that somebody felt deceived. Yeah, I agree. Or a client, right? Right, or a client, yeah. A client. Again, we're back to saying, hey, this is what the product does and it doesn't do this, but we you know, hope sometime in the future it will do that, but right now it doesn't. And yeah. right now is the buy decision, so you're buying it as it stands. Yep, that's wonderful leadership example right there. Being able to say that from the top person in the organization on down. That's how we operate. That's the culture. And that's what you've built, which I think is incredibly empowering 
for the individuals on your team, I'm sure, to be able to operate with the freedom in that environment to not be held, you know, to some other standard. You have to deliver, you have to lie, or you have to obfuscate the truth or well, and, say this, but mean this. Yeah. So let's not let's not lose sight of the fact that you know you still have to make your revenue goals. You still have to be profitable. All that stuff remains true, right? I mean, if you can't if you can't merge those two things together, the yeah. integrity piece and the pragmatic piece, yeah. then you won't, you don't have a business. Okay. You sure as hell I, don't have a sustainable business. That I, I think that sustainability piece uh, is key. Um, and as you told me before that, you know, sustainability is what it's all about, right? And whether you're venture backed or PE backed or self-funded or bootstrapped or whatever it is, sustainability is key no matter what. And that comes from being truthful, being honest, being up front. But I think we're, we're getting ready to, you know, and who knows to what extent and all that kind of stuff. Right. But yeah. there are a lot of indications right now that, uh, you know, the next year is not exactly going to be the most fun. Um, yeah. And so, you know, your ability to sustain uh, during those moments is, is, is everything. Yeah. Yeah. And whether or not your network will call you back will depend on how well you did that before. So you might as well start doing it well now. <laughs> that's that <laughs> if you is, haven't been already. That's very, very true, right? And you also, <laughs> you know, you will find out sometimes people don't call you back in your network because their values were never really consonant with yours. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the things that is hard is that you start to figure out at some point, like who your friends really are. Mm -hmm. Right. And and uh, and invariably um, you're disappointed and you're also yeah. amazed. I mean, I think it's it's one of the things that's a hugely true about startup land is um, the people that you think are going to really rally to your side and make a big mm -hmm. difference. Yep. Very few of them do. They'll talk. Well, talk, 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 all, yep. all kind, of, all the time, right? Yep. But yep. they won't actually do anything, and then somebody that you hardly know will suddenly enter the picture, stage left, and a year later, the business is transformed in some way yeah. because of them, right? And that yep. is, I mean, seriously, that is just that's the way I see it. Yeah, very true. Well, Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure to get to talk with you, hear about your background, experience, everything from politics to starting your own company and building a culture based on truth and authenticity. And just, you know, wonderful to hear the lessons that you've learned and the, what you embody with your clients, with your company. Uh, we'll have details on where people can check out Proof Analytics um, in the show notes. So be sure to do that as well and connection details with you on LinkedIn. So Mark, thank you so much for sharing your time, wisdom and expertise. I can't wait to see all the incredible things that you and the Proof Analytics team are going to do in the future. Thanks, man. I really enjoyed it. Me too. Take care. All right. See you.